Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Class of the Week. Um, I have my um, regular co-host, that's what he calls me on virtual plant clinics. Um, Dr. Lester is here. You need, there you go. <laughs> Good morning. Yes, and um, we do have um, some other people from the county watching us today. Our, our regular uh, friend Karen from Mosquito Control is on. Hopefully, if all her equipment is working, she's going to be talking to us at the end. And we have a few other um, people watching in as well, looking in. But let's get started with this talking about lawns. Now, a lot of people think lawns and Florida friendly landscaping don't go together, but they actually do, and we're going to explain why. But I am Lily Browning. I work for Hernando County Utilities uh, in the Water Conservation Department. And here is my email. You're going to see it several times throughout the presentation. So if you have any questions, that is the best way to reach me. Um, uh, my email follows me around. I really can't leave it. I put it on this. So <laughs> it kind of follows me around. Yep. Bill has one too. Yep. And um, Dr. Lester, uh, whose name I misspelled there. That's funny that Lillian misspelled William there, but I, I had a typo there. Mr. Willem Lester, Dr. Willem Lester is here. Uh, we'll just call him Bill. That'll make it easier. <laughs> that works for me. That's yeah, fine. And here's his email. So if you have any questions about anything we go over, go ahead and email one of us. Or if you would like a PDF copy, as always, of this presentation, just email me and um, I'll be glad to send you one. So, Florida Friendly Landscaping. Here are the nine principles of Florida Friendly Landscaping, and they do come into play when we're talking about lawns. They come into play a great deal <laughs> when we're talking about um, our home turf. Right plant, right place is number one, probably even with lawns. We're gonna be talking about watering efficiently, fertilizing appropriately, and number six, managing yard pests responsibly. Recycling even fits into it, and we'll kind of touch into that, as well as number eight, really, reducing stormwater runoff, um, which protects the waterfront. So there are, all, all of the principles can work together to help you have a decent lawn that you're not wasting too many resources trying to keep nice. But first let's talk about where did lawns come from? Why do we even have them? You know, what, what, what is, why do they exist? Um, I'm moving some stuff around so I can see my <laughs> slides here. Really the middle class didn't have them in, at least in America until the late 1800s. And around about the same time, um, the real mower, like this little girl is pushing here, this must have been an advertisement to show you how easy it is you know, to use them. Um, and apparently you can even be all dressed up and not even get you know, dirty or sweaty or anything using one of these. What happened was way back when, you know, people had to utilize every space of their, whatever land they had, to survive. They couldn't run out to Walmart or to Winn-Dixie or to Publix or whatever. They needed to utilize whatever space they had or were given um, for their use to survive, to um, grow food, to have some, you know, cow for milk, various things as that. So there wasn't really such a thing as a yard for pleasure, you know, that wasn't really heard of or thought of until people you know, got more comfortable. And what they were trying to emulate is way back when in Europe, you know, um, you know, we've seen pictures of the castles and everything and these massive expanses of lawn. That's because they were flaunting their wealth. They were saying, I have so much land and I am so rich. I can have land that I do nothing with but just have this, you know, lawn on it. So over time, the middle class wanted to emulate that in any way they could. 
And they say, I don't know whether it's true or not, that, you know, better homes and gardens in America kind of really pushed, you know, every good American must have a lawn. <laughs> so um, it became kind of like a status symbol for the rich and then a um, way of showing you're a good citizen, really, you know, for the middle class. And of course, the uh, invention of the real mower, like this girl was pushing, and a garden hose <laughs> made it a lot more practical for your ordinary citizen. You don't have to have somebody out there with a sickle, you know, cutting this lawn and figure out how in the heck you're gonna water it. So those two things, you know, we're thinking of, you know, 1899, 1901, whatever, all those row houses with the tiny yards. So then they had people, equipment to be able to keep a little bit of a nice lawn. And I was thinking, you know, how we've evolved since then. And I was thinking that um, archaeologists many years from now will study our habits and our ways and come to the conclusion that we worship our lawns in some kind of way. Because I was driving around once in the middle of the day on a weekday, and all that I saw was people rushing around doing their lawns, doing something to somebody's lawn. It's a huge occupation of ours. And those um, archeologists may be trying to figure out what benefit we got out of it, if we could eat it, you know, <laughs> what it was. And really it's just to look nice. <laughs> you know, that's, that's why we're doing it. And it is part of our culture. And many of us live in areas that say you have to have not only a lawn, but a really nice looking lawn. So you have a lawn, most likely. So you need to, in your, you move to Florida. You're used to dealing with your lawn up north, which is a little more conducive to growing <laughs> turf than Florida. That 1800 um, timeline was for America in general. I'm willing to bet didn't really catch on in Florida, probably till around the 1930s. What do you think, Phil? That's probably about right. Yeah, with because then we had more quote, quote, Yankees <laughs> moving down and they wanted things to be the way they were. And they thought we got to build these towns and we got to make it look like Americana and that includes lawns. So then that got all the horticulturalists um, hybridizing and coming up with ways to create, you know, lawns for homes. So you have one. You come at, the first thing you need to know as a Floridian is, is what you have really the best location for a lawn. Lawns need a lot of sun. Bill mentioned yesterday to mention that if your yard, maybe you bought a wooded lot and you just made enough room to build your house or put your house in there and it's all shaded in wonderful oak trees that you love. It's fantastic and great, you know, great place to live, not very conducive to lawns. Lawns need six to eight hours of sunlight every day in order to thrive and do well. Soil's a big thing. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of our sandy soils I say they just make it more challenging for lawns because on the other hand, what do they put on soil that where they can't grow anything else for erosion purposes? Turf, that's what, you know, it's the cheapest, easiest thing that's going to take hold and stop erosion on the roadsides and things like that. So we know turf itself should deal with any kind of, um, soil but it also depends on the type of turf that we're putting down and also the amount of traffic and I don't mean like if you're driving over your lawn but I mean if your neighbors are welcome to Florida yeah I sometimes do that too um but just foot traffic and things like that some of our turf is not all that um, able to deal with that so if you have a space that isn't the best place for a lawn if you have you know, if you're allowed to in your community, what else could you grow in that area? That's something we need to think about. And we're going to touch on, but 
Let's say you walked out your door because you moved here now and you're going to get to know this lawn because you're not going to be able to properly maintain it unless you start a relationship <laughs> with your lawn. And you got to know what it is, for one thing. I know Dr. Lester gets phone calls, my lawn this, my lawn that. Well, what kind of lawn do you have? I don't know. So there's several different types in Central Florida. There is, you may be confused. Do I have St. Augustine? Do I have Floritan? People, you know, say both things. Well, they're right. <laughs> Floritan is a variety of St. Augustine. Or you may have Bahia grass. Those are the two we're going to cover today because in Hernando County, it is most likely that you have one of those two. If you're in the villages, you very well could have zoysia grass. And um, we're, we're not covering that one because not a lot of people here have it. So if you do have it, contact your county extension office. If you're in the villages, contact um, Lisa Sanderson or um, Oh, what's the FFL lady? Norma. Norma. Yeah, Norma over there, or even Jim Davis, who is the director in Hernando and Sumter. They can guide you because Zoysia has a little bit of different practices than um, these other two. You might have Bermuda, whether on purpose or not, but that's not as common. And Dr. Lester and I each have what we call a diverse lawn area. That means Maybe half Bahia, half weeds, whatever, have grown in there. <laughs> or you might have all kinds of mixtures. I know the thing for a while in Hernando to follow codes, they would put um, Floritam in the front and Bahia in the back. And that sometimes uh, causes issues for people as well. But we're going to cover St. Augustine, Floritam lawns, and Bahia. So how are you gonna know which one you have? If you have a Floritam lawn, it's gonna look pretty much like this. If you're from up north, you're gonna say, well, that's crabgrass. <laughs> well, it is, it's um, St. Augustine, the original grass that they hybridized all this out of. Bill and I found out as we were walking one day along the seashore, <laughs> in Bayport, actually a native grass, the original version of it. And we saw the best stand of St. Augustine we've ever seen in our lives. And what was it, about a foot and a half tall? Yeah, it was at least six, eight inches, at least eight inches tall. Okay. And it looked great. It did, but it was kind of growing in bunches. It was really mm -hmm. dark green. It was literally where the tide would come in. So salt was not bothering it at all. But so some, and it was in the shade. So somebody along the line said, wow, see how well this native kind of bunch grass is growing. Let's take it and try to preserve its good attributes and make a lawn grass out of it. Nature never decided to make a meadow out of that kind of grass. But how many varieties of St. Augustine are there? Probably eight or 10, you know, there's Captiva, there's um, Bitter Blue, there's all sorts of them. The kind you most likely have in Central Florida is Floritan. And that was developed um, oh, it was in 1973, I believe. Yes. Mm -hmm by the University of Florida and a cooperation with Texas A&M. See the name? University of Florida, Texas A&M, Floritam. There we go, that's why they named it that. And it was developed a hybrid of a hybrid of a hybrid of a hybrid. Nowhere near anything you could call native anymore, <laughs> you know? And its purpose was to be resistant to chinch bugs because that was St. Augustine's issue. And it was probably till 1975. <laughs> and then it began having chinch bugs as much as any other St. Augustine until recently. And we're going to get into that as well. And I don't think the grass changed. I think we have 
killed the chinch bugs down to almost nothing. So that's its history. Um, and its characteristics is it has these wide blades that, um, and it spreads in runners. So therefore it has like good coverage when you first put it down. Um, it's a darker green, not dark green like your fescues or your Kentucky ryegrass that you're used to up north. Not the green, green grass at home, but it is, you know, it's a darker green for a lot of Florida grasses. Um, so people enjoy that aspect of it. The benefits of turf in general, in general, like I mentioned erosion, it does stop erosion. Turf, um, it's a catch-22 in that it helps reduce noise pollution in your neighborhood, but the equipment utilized to maintain that lawn adds to noise <laughs> pollution in your neighborhood. It also makes things cooler. You know, if you, where are you gonna wanna stand in August? Out on the street or out on the sidewalk or in your yard? You know, it's, it makes things a lot cooler. That's what turf does for us, provides nice oxygen. They say it adds to the um, curb appeal. Oh, and Dr. Lester, there, have you seen the commercial? I believe it's for a mower where the one neighbor is mentally thanking the other neighbor for being such a good steward to his lawn and helping that neighbor's uh, property value. What do you say about lawns and property value? What have you told me? Technically, the lawn does not have as big of an impact on property values as people might think. It does, um, it depends on where the housing market is. If there's a lot of houses on the market for sale, if yours has a perfect lawn and that looks, has curb appeal, you're probably going to get an offer quicker. But right now, I know in Hernando County and across most of Florida, the housing market is really tight. So if your lawn looks horrible, and you put your house up for sale, you will have an offer in 24 hours at top dollar. Okay. And when you, you had an evaluation appraisal of the home that you bought and nowhere mm -hmm. on there, did you see anything about landscape or lawn? <laughs> you know, one yeah, layer when they Yeah, when they up, um, professionally appraise a house for um, a mortgage and for insurance purposes, there is no line or spot where they evaluate the lawn or even mention of a lawn. So good looking lawn can help its- um, Curb appeal. Curb attract appeal and how attractive it. it looks to sellers, but really does not have a big impact on the actual price. You know, if housing prices are really high, your house is worth a lot. If housing right. prices are low, your house isn't worth quite as much. The drawbacks of um, the Floritam lawns is that they do need supplemental irrigation if we are not getting enough rain. They don't need as much as we think they do. Um, and chinch bugs used to be a problem and people still think they are a problem. So you're treating, um, you know, we're still treating chinch bugs that may or may not even be there. We've gotten into the habit of treating invisible chinch bugs. <laughs> And we're kind of, we'll discuss that later. It does have disease potential. Um, probably almost every Central Florida, Floritan lawn may have a touch of what is called take all root rot, which is a fungus. Chances are really high that that is, could be the problem with your lawn and not chinch bugs but the uh, companies for so long have been taught chinch bug, chinch bug, chinch bug. As Dr. Lester said, if you're told you have chinch bugs, make them show you <laughs> the chinch bugs. So it is, and it needs um, some fertilization and we'll let Dr. Lester cover all that. So I will let you take over now with talking about its water needs for uh, floor tan lawns. Okay, like Lily mentioned, people generally think that uh, St. Augustine lawns need more water than what they really need. And the amount of water it needs per week kind of plays into how healthy it is. So an otherwise healthy St. Augustine lawn during the growing season, which would be from now all the way up to October, needs about one inch of water per week. 
And we tell people that when you irrigate your lawn, which you're allowed to do once a week here in Hernando County, if you're in a different county, it varies from county to county. So I'm not sure what the rules are in anywhere other than Hernando, but here in Hernando, you can only water once a week. And we recommend putting down a half an inch to three quarters of an inch of water each time you water. Because if you add a lot more water than that, you're just wasting water. Because water, whether it comes from irrigation or rainfall, um, on a very, very sandy soil will move 12 inches through the soil profile, um, 12 inches deep for every inch of water that you put down. So only put down half an inch to three quarters of an inch each time. And if we get any rainfall at all, you're good with the St. Augustine lawn if it's otherwise healthy. If it has other, other kind of underlying problems where the roots are damaged, the roots are unhealthy, well, the lawn can't take water up very well that way anyway. So adding more water is not gonna fix that. People seem to think that watering, watering and fertilizing are the two cure-alls. So no matter what's wrong with your lawn, if you just add more water or more fertilizer, that's gonna fix it. And it really doesn't. A lot of times we see people with underlying disease problems and they make it even worse by adding more water and more fertilizer. If your irrigation system is broken, you have broken sprinkler heads or it's out of adjustment or there's some other kind of problem, watering more often and fertilizing more often will not fix the problems. It generally will make it worse. So like I said, about three quarters of an inch per irrigation event. And with Floritam for most of the year, you're gonna be fine. If we go into a very long dry period or a drought, especially during the summer, that can make it stressful on your lawn. But if it's otherwise healthy, being cut the right height, everything else is okay with it, it can survive a little bit of dry period with just once a week irrigation. So, so don't think that the solution to every problem is water because it definitely is. Okay, next slide. So you wanna water efficiently. Um, this picture here is how we recommend people um, evaluate your irrigation system, because people will ask me, they say, I have a sprinkler system. How long do I run each zone for? I'm like, I don't know. It depends on what kind of sprinkler heads you have, how many heads you have in that zone, uh, how many rotors you have, how many pop-up heads. You have to actually go out there and test it. So if you go in your yard and you have a sprinkler system, get yourself a bunch of either cat food cans or tuna fish cans or any kind of small container Little plastic Tupperware containers work fine also. Scatter them around that area and run zone one and run it for however long it's already set on the timer to go. Let's say it's 40 minutes. So run it for 40 minutes, go out there and check those little cans with the ruler and see how much water you put down. If you put down a quarter inch, it needs to run for longer. If you put down an inch and a half, you need to run it for a shorter period of time. And you can keep, you know, fine tuning it and messing with it until you get it to go a half to three quarters of an inch. Now, if you check all those cans and one of them is totally empty, you have a broken sprinkler head. If half of them are completely full, the other half are almost empty or completely empty, you have maybe multiple broken sprinkler heads or poor sprinkler system design. So it gives you a really good idea of how much water you're actually putting down for whatever period of time. Now, depending on what kind of heads you have, you may have to run that zone for as little as 15 minutes or as long as one hour. It all depends on the sprinkler heads, how many heads you have, how much area each head covers, depends on a lot of things. So you have to actually go out there and physically test it zone by zone to get your timing correct. Next slide. So like I said, we are under once a week irrigation here in Hernando County. And if you have any other questions about that, if you email Lily, she can help you figure out what day you're supposed to water. And she will tell you that you're allowed to water either in the morning before 8 a.m. or in the evening after 6 p.m., but not both. Because that would be watering twice in one week and you can only do it once. So your day of the week is based on the last number in your street address. 
I'm at 1115, so my day is Wednesday. Okay, if I watered, I would water on Wednesday, but I don't water, so it doesn't really matter a whole lot to me. So if you have any more questions about that, contact Lily. She's in charge of that department. Oh, well, I'm not in charge of it, but she's but completely in charge of that department and she no, can no. handle all your questions. Her name is Alice. <laughs> is who's in charge. So um, fertilizing your St. Augustine lawn. People also seem to think that St. Augustine grass needs a lot more fertilizer than what it really does. St. Augustine does benefit from fertilization, but you want to do it, and you're probably asking yourselves, well, how often do I do it? How much do I put down each time? We have been getting a lot of questions recently about what formulation or brand should I use? What about weed and feed? I'll touch on that. What about compost? Fertilizing anything, it is much better to fertilize it very lightly and a little bit more often. But unfortunately, most services fertilize St. Augustine lawns too often. You don't need to be fertilized once a month. You don't even need it three times a year. With St. Augustine, as little as once or twice a year is going to keep your grass growing just fine. You should always have a reason to fertilize. And saying it's April 1st, that's not a very good reason. That's called calendar fertilizing. We don't recommend that. Saying my grass looks a little, it has started to grow for spring and probably most of yours have at this time of year. And it looks a little bit yellow, doesn't look green enough, doesn't look like it's growing fast enough. Okay, that's a good reason to fertilize. So fertilize lightly once. You may have to do it again in the late summer, especially if we get a lot of rain. Because remember what I said, uh, rainfall is gonna move uh, one inch of rainfall moves 12 inches through sandy soil. Maybe lots of summer rain has washed the fertilizer out of the soil. You may have to fertilize lightly again in the fall. Don't let services or neighbors or your brother-in-law tell you you need to fertilize every month or every other month or five times every summer. That's just too much and it will make your grass grow like crazy. So if you really want the exercise and you really want to get out there and cut it every four days, by all means, go ahead and fertilize heavily, but that's what you're going to get as a result of the fertilizing. And green is just so green. Your grass is only going to turn so green. If it looks green, leave it alone. Doesn't need any more fertilizer. Our best recommendations are you follow the directions on the bag of fertilizer for exactly how much to put down. There are calculations for depending on how many square feet you have and what fertilizer you're using. They are very complicated. If you're ever thinking, well, I wanna know exactly how much to apply, contact our office. If you call here on a Thursday, we have a master gardener here all day Thursday, who is more than happy to help do the calculations for you, but I am not gonna get into the math here today, so. That's I'm sure Lily appreciates that, that. She doesn't like math very much. No, that's the main reason I don't fertilize because there's math. <laughs> yeah, but as a general rule, lighter is better. Don't go heavy because that gets into a feast and famine kind of routine for your lawn and follow the directions on the uh, label on the fertilizer bag. So what about weed and feed? Don't use weed and feed. It does not work very well here as far as killing weeds. We control weeds in the spring here in February, but you're not allowed to fertilize your lawn until April 1st, because right now, January, February, and March here in Hernando County, homeowners are not allowed to fertilize their lawns. That's by county ordinance. So you take care of weeds at one time of the year and you fertilize at a different time of the year. Weed and feed may work great in Michigan or New Jersey or somewhere else, it does not work well here in Florida. And granular weed killers are not, in my experience, are not very effective. A liquid one is gonna be much more effective and you can actually aim it and spray it directly on the weeds that you're trying to control. Compost, compost is fantastic for St. Augustine lawns. They absolutely love it. They will turn a little bit greener. They will grow a little bit better. It acts like a really mild fertilizer. So it's probably not gonna to totally replace fertilizing your lawn, 
but St. Augustine lawns really, really like a top dressing of compost. It helps to build the soil up, especially if you have very, very sandy soil. And can you purchase that? You can purchase that at any big box store. Uh, some different brands they sell, black cow cow manure works just fine. There's other brands of compost. You'll probably see bags of mushroom compost that works very well. And just take a couple bags and just you just by hand, take a handful and just scatter it widely over your lawn. The next time you water it or it rains, it's going to work itself into the base of the turf grass and work its way into the soil. But long term, if you do that a couple times a year, long term, your lawn is going to be much, much healthier and start to grow much better. You're probably going to have fewer problems if you keep doing that long term. So insect control, as Lily probably alluded to earlier, the number one insect pest for St. Augustine lawns are chinch bugs. And chinch bugs are a very common insect here in all of Florida. Chinch bugs really like it where it's very sunny and very hot. So if you do have a chinch bug problem, they tend to pop up on the section of lawn that's right next to a sidewalk or a driveway or the curb because the concrete makes the grass a little bit hotter in that spot. At our office, I very, very rarely see chinch bugs. So even though chinch bugs get blamed for every dead spot in a St. Augustine lawn, when we check very closely and we have a microscope and you know we'll look at samples under the microscope, most people don't have chinch bugs. That's not their, their actual underlying problem. By the end of summer, if you check any turf sample, you're probably gonna find a few chinch bugs. Technically, you have to have on average 20 chinch bugs or more per square foot for it to be a big enough problem to spray for. Services love to spray for chinch bugs. Chinch bugs are only out, they're just now coming out and their populations go up and they are a problem June, July, August, and September. So you do not have chinch bugs in January, February, and March. They are not out there. They're dormant, they're, they're in the egg form probably in your lawn. If you have somebody with a service knock at your front door and point to a dead spot in your lawn and say you have chinch bugs, you probably don't. There's a dozen different things it could be. So unless your professional gets out there with their head down and their butt up in the air and a little hand lens in her hand, they can't say that your problem is chinch bugs. You have to actually use a hand lens or a magnifying glass or a microscope to tell for sure if you have them. So don't assume you have chinch bugs. You probably don't. But if you have a problem with dead spots in your St. Augustine lawn, you do need to find out what the real problem is. And it's probably not chinch bugs and putting down an insecticide for chinch bugs will not cure your problem. Next slide. What do you feel though about broadcast spraying to kill every single living thing in your yard? Broadcast spray, spraying with a uh, wide spectrum insecticide is never a good idea on your lawn. Whether it's spraying for chinch bugs, Spoke with a lady yesterday who came by the office who said she has a service that sprays every month for fleas in her yard. I said, they're probably spraying for imaginary fleas at this point because you probably don't have fleas. And if you did have fleas, you should use a um, insect growth regulator once, get rid of the problem, and you're not gonna have to spray every month. So spraying your entire lawn for imaginary chinch bugs without verifying that Number one, you have them. Number two, you have a bunch of them. Number three, the appropriate thing to do is spraying is not a good idea. You tend to cause a lot of problems down the road that are a whole lot worse than a couple of chinch bugs. So we control, <clears throat> some people go into an absolute panic over weeds in their St. Augustine lawn and there are herbicides out there that are, you know, weed killers that are labeled to be used in a St. Augustine lawn. Make sure whatever you use, it says on the label, it is safe to use on St. Augustine grass. Make sure it's safe to use on Floritam. <clears throat> Make sure it's going to um, kill the weed that you're trying to kill. 
keep in mind here in Central Florida, weeds are only here for a short period of time. We have spring weeds that are out right now. We have summer weeds that are totally different. We have wintertime weeds that are totally different. So if we're going to be changing seasons soon, there's no point spraying for a weed that's gonna die and disappear in one month anyway. So get an idea of what kind of weeds you're having a problem with and only spray for them if you know they're gonna be around for a while. The best thing to do is just learn to live with a few weeds. Trying to get your lawn weed free is gonna cost so much money and take so much work, it's really not worth it. Keeping your lawn reasonably weed free is realistic, but you're gonna to have to learn a little bit about what products to use, what's gonna be effective, and do I really need to be trying to kill this weed that I have a huge problem with today that's gonna to be magically gone in 30 days anyway, because it's gonna turn from spring into summer. Um, those different things, uh, gosh, I see them all the time on Facebook about using vinegar and baking soda and things like that to kill weeds, they don't work. They, they are partly effective on teeny tiny newly germinated weeds or quarter inch, half inch tall. Other than that, they don't work. Um, what else about weeds? The best thing to do is just kind of learn how to live with the weeds. Dollar weed is one of the most common ones we get asked about with St. Augustine lawns. If you have a lot of dollar weed, you water too much. Simple as that. It tells on you. It tells on you because dollar weed is a semi-aquatic weed. If you ever find a little lake or pond with um, dollar weed growing around the edge, it grows like crazy. The leaves will get really, really, really large. So if we see a picture of dollar weed with nice large leaves and it's grown really well, you water too much. Um, I heard a gentleman from Water Management District, he had a good saying, saying they look like lily pads. <laughs> There's a reason <laughs> they look like lily pads. And I have seen them growing literally in the water on yes, um, they do. They grow photos in the of water. it. Right. Now it may not be your fault. Maybe it's a low wet area naturally, but in general, if you have dollar weed, there, there's a lot of water on that lawn. And probably the most common problem that we see at our office with St. Augustine lawns, and keep in mind, this is in Hernando County, and this applies mostly to Spring Hill in Hernando County, because they have very, very sandy soils. Biggest thing that we see is lawn diseases. And the number one lawn disease we see is something that's called take all root rot. We can look at a turf grass sample under the microscope and tell pretty quickly whether it has take all root rot or not. And most of the samples we look at do have it. By comparison, most of the samples we look at, if we're looking for chinch bugs, Gosh, I haven't seen a chinch bug brought in the front door in a year and a half, two years. But some weeks we'll see like 10 cases of take all root rock come in the door that we diagnose. There are a couple other St. Augustine diseases, gray leaf spot we'll see during the summer. And that's where, if you look at your St. Augustine grass blades, because they're, they're fairly wide, if the grass blades start to have dark spots on them, the spread, they're kind of oblong shaped, and a little bit of yellowish around the edges, that's gray leaf spot. That's not a huge problem. That's not going to kill your lawn. It usually, whenever I see it, it goes hand in hand with dull lawnmower blades. So if the grass has been, cutting, been getting cut with a dull lawnmower blade, if the edges are really, really jagged, I see a lot of gray leaf spot. So sharpen those lawnmower blades, that helps. We do see one or two other diseases on occasion in the winter, but very, very rarely. There's a really unusual virus that's going around Florida that affects St. Augustine grass. We have not had a reported case here in Hernando County yet. So you may be the first one to get it, it's possible. But what we mostly see is take all root rot and good management of your St. Augustine grass goes a long way to dealing with that disease. And if you have the virus, Dr. Lester will be very excited because he's bored with yeah, take-all root rot. <laughs> I got a, uh, there was a training, a webinar that I missed and they sent me a email with a link to it. 
So when in my free time, I need to watch that. Okay, I'll talk about mowing. Okay. Um, this is probably the number one issue, bad in watering with your um, floor tan lawn. People mow it too low. Your service mows it too low or you mow it too low. It really needs to be three and a half to four inches. And that is, it's so vital to the health of the lawn, which is good news and bad news. It's bad news because nobody wants to do it. They want to look like they live on a golf course. It's good news in that it is such an easy fix. Just allow it to grow that tall, all of it, not one blade like this <laughs> picture shows here. Um, and get that ruler out there. Measure after your mowing company mows, see that they are mowing it at the proper height. They'll tell you they are, but you know, a, a ruler doesn't lie. And I know Dr. Lester has done that with a mowing company. I, I have a yardstick. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, when he moved, um, he gave up having a mowing company and mows it himself. But um, the, for floor tan, higher is better. It gives it more surface area so that it can photosynthesize more. It um, crowds out some weeds. Also, the roots mirror the shoots. Remember he talked about if we water that three quarters of an inch, for every inch you get 12 inches. So three quarters of an inch should get you like eight inches. You know, um, if you have four inch shoots, you're gonna have four inch <laughs> roots, maybe hopefully even a little longer. You know, watering more than that, going further down than that is you're watering nothing. You're watering the abyss and it's gonna go right into the aquifer. Um, which is not necessarily bad, as long as there's not chemicals all over your lawn that it's taking with it. And um, if you are a customer of ours at Hernando County Utilities or any municipal place where you pay for your water, why are you gonna pay us more, you know, you, you know, water efficiently for exactly what your lawn needs? And what Bill touched on too, that sharp mower blade is so incredibly yeah. important too. And um, just keep them, you know, keep those blades really sharp. A sharp blade cuts, a dull blade tears. And as we just learned, could open the door to diseases. So that's pretty a pretty easy thing to follow. So if you are pretty sure, no, I don't have Floritan lawn. I have something, you know, that's thinner and like a lighter green. Well, if you have this seed head here, it's telling you peace. You most with the two heads. There are some with three heads. That's probably a Bermuda variety. If, if you have these seed heads, you most likely have a Bahia grass lawn. Bahia grass lawns are the least maintenance lawn, you know, that you can you can have here in Florida, at least at this point. It's on the roadsides. Is anybody doing anything with that except mowing it? Occasionally, <laughs> no, they're not. So, and if, as long as it's raining, you know, it looks pretty decent, 60 miles an hour <laughs> as you're going by. So people get really upset about these seed heads. It blows their minds. And some people tell me, well, it's because of my HOA. You know, you mow your Mejia grass lawn and Three hours later, these <laughs> seeds pop up, and then your HOA is after you that your lawn is too high. These seed heads, some of these seeds, actually, if you wait long enough, can be viable. Um, I like seeing them because, like Dr. Lester, I have a mixture of bahia and weeds. And so every time they pop up, I'm like, wow, there's some bahia still in here. <laughs> um, it's a little bit lighter green the grass itself um, with like narrow leaf, narrow leaf blades. The benefits are that you can water it, fertilize it once a year maybe. If you want to, you don't have to. It's gonna be okay. Um, the drawbacks, people don't like these seed heads. Um, the other drawbacks is that it's more, it has grows in clumps, not in runners. So you do have 
open spaces in which weeds do encroach. I learned um, something from the master gardener that Bernie, yeah, that Bernie, that Bill mentioned, <laughs> his name is Bernie, he was there on Thursdays, that, you know, this was um, brought to Florida in about 1914 from South America, probably for pastures. And, you know, and at that time also, you know, we were building roads and stuff. So maybe roadsides for erosion, all of that. Well, in South America, the gazelles or whatever would, you know, eat this, it would get much higher than we allow it to eat it and redistribute either by breaking these seed heads off or digesting them and <laughs> replanting them that way. So we cut it, you know, we cut it off um, shorter than it would be in the wild. And so, you know, we may let some of these seed heads fall, but what he suggested doing is every three or four years going to get some bahia grass seed and overseeding it to kind of try and replicate what would have happened in nature. So that's not, you know, a bad idea either. Said the benefits are you can have this lawn and pretty much ignore it and have a okay looking lawn. You can give it a medium amount of maintenance, watering it when it's dry, fertilizing it once a year, composting it, great idea, and have a really good looking bahia grass. You can baby it and treat it like you would St. Augustine and it will hate you. It, it will rebel against that. So that medium amount of um, maintenance is best for the bahia or do like Dr. Lester and I do, just let it do its thing. Uh, here we go with talking about water requirements for Bahia. Okay, well, I was just about to start answering a question in the uh, chat box here. Kim asked about what time of year do you suggest to put the uh, Bahia seed down? It's best to wait until we start getting into the rainy season where we get some regular rain because when you put the seed down, it just gets sowed on the surface and you can't let it dry out or you really don't wanna let it dry out. Now, on a sunny day like today, what happens after 10 minutes? It dries out. So you're gonna to have to um, water it. And I mean, just water very, very, very shallow. Just get the surface wet several times a day. The more often you do it, the better it is. So you don't want to run your irrigation system. You just want to go out there with a garden hose and give it a quick spraying. The moisture you can keep the surface, the more seed that's going to germinate. But even if you're not perfect at keeping the surface moist, some of the seed will still germinate. And for people who have an existing bahia grass lawn, to get a bag of bahia grass seed and during the rainy season, go out there and just keep throwing some extra seed out you'll see your lawn start to get thicker bit by bit over time. So it's a good long-term kind of uh, thing to do to help give you a little bit more bahia grass lawn out there. So watering requirements, bahia grass is very drought tolerant. We can go into an extended dry period and your lawn will turn brown. It looks like it's totally dead. And then once it's, when it starts raining, you can sit there and look out your window and literally watch it turn green. It will come back, um, but it looks really bad while it's brown and dead during an extended dry period. Watering your bahia grass lawn, it really never needs to be watered. If you water it once a week, you know, in Hernando County, staying within the once a week um, watering restrictions, that's fine. Between once a week and regular rains is more than enough. The problem with bahia is when we get into the summer, and it's sunny and warm, if you give it a lot of water, it will grow like crazy. You're gonna be in the boat where you're gonna to have to cut it every four days because you don't wanna get in the habit of cutting it extra short to make it last seven days. You need to cut it when it needs it and you need to cut it at the right height. So your lawn will not die if you don't water it. I've seen, I've seen droughts and I've seen lawns that look like they're, they're crispy, crunchy. And when it starts to rain, boom, they'll come right back. Yep. Fertilizing, gosh, you really don't have to fertilize a bahia lawn. My yard is about half bahia and half, uh, what's the term, diverse lawn yes. materials. Uh -huh. it's a diverse Weeds lawn and all area. kinds of other things. I've never fertilized mine. 
it, it doesn't really need it. Bahia lawns will benefit from a light fertilizing. You really would never want to do it more than maybe twice a year, spring and late summer and very lightly. But it, it, I mean, it will grow, it'll turn greener, it'll grow better. So it benefits from it, but it's not really required. Um, so what will happen if I don't fertilize your Bahia grass? It'll do just fine. It'll be okay. Like I said earlier, if you have a good reason to fertilize it, like I think it should look greener. I want it to grow a little bit faster, look a little bit healthier. As long as we're into the growing season, and this being early April, we are in the growing season now, it's appropriate to fertilize it lightly, but you don't have to with Bahia. Don't let a service tell you that you have to fertilize it because you really don't. With Bahia grass, every different type of turf grass has this one main insect pest and the main insect pest for Bahia is um, mole crickets and you see a nice close-up picture of a mole cricket here. I have never seen a homeowner have enough mole crickets in their Bahia lawn for it to be a problem. All of you, if you have a Bahia lawn, you have a few mole crickets out there. If you want to find them, go out at night because they come out and they crawl around at night if you have a porch light or a street light, or even if you've got the flashlight, they are attracted to lights. That's a good way to find them. Uh, ranchers used to have terrible problems years ago with mole crickets because we brought a number of invasive ones here from South America back in the, I think, 1800s. And they were a terrible problem in Bahia pastures, but we brought some beneficial insects, uh, at least one parasitoid wasp, and a type of nematode that's kept them under control in pastures. So if you're a rancher, it may be a problem sometimes in your pasture, but if you're a homeowner, you, I've never known a homeowner that had enough mole crickets where it was actually justified for them to treat for. Don't think if you see one mole cricket, you gotta go out there and spray, you can live with one or two. It's just when you have too many, you have to do something. We control, like Lily said, Bahia grass is a thin growing grass. It does not spread through runners. It doesn't cover the lawn really well. So over time, your Bahia grass will get thinner and thinner and thinner if you don't overseed on some kind of regular base. That helps to keep it thicker and thicker and thicker. The thinner it is, the more empty space there is for weeds to come in. So weeds are generally a fact of life with Bahia lawns. There are herbicides that are labeled for use on Bahia lawns. Make sure anything you're going to use says safe to use on Bahia lawns on the label and use them. Trying to control all the weeds in the Bahia lawn is a losing battle. You're never going to win that one. You can chase them around and try to reduce the percentage of weeds you have. Keep in mind, and this is a problem sometimes with services, they'll come and knock on your door and they'll say, We'll, we have a special, we'll spray your yard and we'll kill the weeds and we'll make it look better. If your lawn is half Bahia and half weeds and either you or a service sprays it and it's effective and you kill most of those weeds, what are you gonna have almost 50% of now? Nothing, <laughs> dead. Nothing, <laughs> bare dirt. So, so don't be surprised to go out there and it's like, oh my gosh, my yard is half bare. Well, you killed half of what was living out there. So. Think about those things before you go and kill all the weeds. Do you have a plan for filling it back in with something? Because otherwise, if you leave it empty, you're just going to get crop number two of weeds. If you kill them, you get crop number three of weeds. They're going to keep coming back. So you need to think about what your, your long-term goal is and how you're going to get there with that. Next slide. Oh. Oh, with mowing, yes. with the hay grass, with mowing, it's... Um... Kind of the same issue but it could stand to be a little even higher than St. Augustine grass. Um, the hail will be happy to be you know three three and a half to even five inches. A lot of your mowers may not mow that high so what I would, would tell you to do is put it up as high as it goes. You know that's probably the easiest thing to do. This person here it looks like they waited a bit too long to mow. What is um it took me a while to figure out those were leaves there. I thought it was mowing over stones or something too. Um, 
you want to try, no matter what type of lawn you have that you're mowing, you want to try not to remove more than a third of the blade at a time. Mowing is pruning. It's pruning each of those little, you know, blades. And as a rule, when you're pruning anything, you don't want to remove more than a third of it. You want it to be dry, not wet, so it doesn't mat down because, you know, those issues. But again, with the bahia grass, mow it as high as you can. Mow it often enough so that you're only removing a third of the blade, if that's possible. If it's raining all week long, you know, might not be possible. Um, and I didn't mention on either of these, but for both of them, let's get back to that uh, principle of recycling. There's no need to bag up your grass clippings and put them, you know, at, at the trash in front of your house to be taken away. Those grass clippings are mostly water, but they contain enough nitrogen that the University of Florida says you can actually skip one of those fertilizations that Dr. Lester talked about a year because you're adding that nitrogen back. It does not cause thatch. What causes thatch, Dr. Lester? Too much water and too much high nitrogen fertilizer. And then letting okay. it grow really tall and cutting it really short. Okay. And get so much water so that it's dependent on you for its water needs and is almost hydroponic. It is, you know, its, it's root system is so shallow. So what I tell people is tell your grass, get a job, <laughs> you know, tell its roots to go down there and find its own water itself and stop relying on you so much. So basically, you know, we tend to think we think harder than it needs to be. We think that fertilization, insect control, you know, these are all uh, uh, weed control, you know, these complicated issues that will make my lawn look good. And, but really those are, you know, supplementary. And like we were saying with Bahia, not even necessary. <laughs> the two biggest factors that will affect the health of your lawn is watering and mowing. That's really good news because we can control that. I hear a lot of people say that lawns waste water. And what I say is I have yet to see a lawn, you know, grow its way up to your irrigation time clock and turn on that irrigation time clock. We're the water wasters, not the lawn. And what it, it's only gonna use what it can use. It's only going to, you know, soak up what it can. The rest is going to leach down into the aquifer or become runoff, and then take pollutants with it into the nearest waterway as it goes down the street and around town. So, the tips that he gave you about making sure you only have half an inch to three quarters of an inch will uh, encourage a good deep root system and give the lawn just what it needs. You know, people tell me my lawns cannot live on one day a week watering. Well, we've had it for about 15 years now, and we still have lawns in the county. So mowing, adjust, adjust your mower as high as can be. I promise you those two things will make a big difference as long as your lawn is not already disseminated by take all root rot or something. And the extension office can assist you with that as well. There are fungicides, there are mostly cultural practices, which means stop watering and fertilizing as much that they can guide you with. Now we keep talking about this diverse lawn area. What are we talking about? Another name for it I have heard is a freedom lawn. That's what I have, I have a freedom lawn. I'm free from worrying about weeds because they're out there or insects. I don't live in a deed restricted community. So therefore, you know, I have different um, expectations of my lawn. Maybe they don't, you know, you know, live up to my neighbor's standards, but it, as master gardeners always say, it's green, it's mowable, and it looks pretty good at 30 miles an hour as you're driving <laughs> by. But also that diverse lawn area, they are finding out, Bill mentioned you're never gonna be free of weeds. Now they're finding out we know scientifically diversity is always a good thing. In any um, living organism, 
diversity is always good. It always adds to the health of that organism. So having a, some weeds in your lawn actually helps add to the health of that lawn for various reasons. And monocultures are never a good thing because when one disease such as take all root rot comes along, it becomes a, you know, a major, major, major problem. Why is it such a major problem? Because we have so many Floritan lawns. That's why it's such, you know, and so, you know, when one disease can wipe out an entire crop, that's an issue. That's why diversity is always good. Also, I know Dr. Lester and I both have a particular weed we didn't put there called um, fog fruit or frog fruit in our lawns. It attracts three different types of butterflies. So do some of the other types of weeds that I have. It attracts life into my lawn. So I'm not gonna complain about it. Some of you may be free to ignore the weeds like I do. The only weeds I don't ignore are sand spurs and I pull them up. I just pull them up and throw them away. I'm going to have to develop a better system of throwing them away because the man who handles the trash bag <laughs> that I happen to be married to gets a little upset if he grabs it and there's sand spurs in there. So, um, but I, and all I do is pull those up. So diversity is always the key to a healthy ecosystem. What if a lawn refuses to grow in a certain area of my yard? I always answer that with stop trying, <laughs> do something different. Um, make a um, flower bed like they've done here, or I mean a landscape bed. There are different ground covers. Maybe it's too shady where you're trying to grow the lawn. Look beyond this bed. I just noticed that on this hell strip as we call that <laughs> patch of uh, turf there that's hard to maintain. Does that look like really healthy turf? Not, Not really. really, no. So maybe if they could, they could continue that bed out further. Ground covers that do well in shade might be a better option. Or just put shrubs or a tree in that spot. Build plant beds, you know, literal, like um, ones you can stand at or, you know, or maybe that's a good place for a patio or a deck. Lawns are not, we tend to think an entire yard must be 80% lawn, and that is not necessarily true. We can get more creative. Think outside the lawn box and what else you can put there. Bill and I just learned this term at um, last week's virtual plant clinic. One of the visitors of the plant clinic gave us this term, benign neglect. I love that, okay. that term. So a little bit of benign neglect is actually better for your lawn than loving it to death. We feel like we as humans have to control everything. Therefore, I'm going to control this lawn by uh, fertilizing it and watering it and have everything under my control. And we end up loving our lawns to death. Just remember, less is more. It is better to under fertilize, <laughs> underwater than to overdo those things. Here are some resources um, that can help you continue learning about this. Um, your Florida Lawn, that is actually will take you to a site with several University of Florida publications regarding your lawn. So you can choose um, Floritam, you can choose Bahia, you can choose whatever you have. They even have establishing your Florida Lawn, all these wonderful, great publications. And on Hernando County Government YouTube, um, I have several other classes that could help you. Last week, we just had five common gardening mistakes. I also covered lawns in it, you know, vaguely, not like a whole hour like this time. Bill and I did a short, this one's eight minutes, so if you don't have that much time, Florida Friendly Fertilizing, and it's just a discussion between us that will help you learn why we fertilize, you know, what we should do, the best ways to do it. And if you are just like ready to say, I've got this area, lawns just aren't going to work at all. I also have um, on Hernando County Government YouTube, you can look up Florida Friendly Landscapes, Landscapings Playlist. You'll and look for when lawns just don't cut it. 
and it's you know about alternatives to lawns that you can watch as well. So, and here are our Facebook pages where you can find out about all of our upcoming classes. And Bill, were you looking at the chat? Did you pretty much handle everything? I've answered most of the questions on there. We have two though. And okay. one of them, I think you just kind of answered, Brooke asked about tips for replacing a conventional lawn with native brown cover plants. Can I just seed in plants or do I need to kill all the behavior first? We do have that other class on uh, when lawns don't cut it. Mm -hmm. That doesn't really address that. It depends on what you're looking for. If you want a mixture um, of bahia and um, you know the the native plants, but it depends. It might confuse your neighbors. It might look like you just weeds to them. So it might be a good idea to kill out the bahia in that area and create a designated very intentional bed where they can see you're growing plants there on purpose that will avoid any hassles you know with your neighbors you know kind of border it off make it look very intentional that's yeah it looks more intentional as opposed right. to neglected right okay I don't have an AO. okay well then there you go <laughs> that, that, then that's and fine and we have the question about how do we get rid of ant mounds in the lawn without affecting the St. Augustine lawn? <clears throat> with ants, ants are a natural part of the environment. If you have a problem with legitimate fire ants or some other kind of biting ants, um, different baits work well. Um, what's the one? Ambro works well, and there's a number of other ones on the market. Guess something that you could put down. <clears throat> just around the ant mound we don't recommend spreading and gosh they have so many different things if you go to the store and you see products that says kills 40 or 50 different things in your lawn put this all over your entire lawn don't do it because that means it's going to kill all the beneficial things in your yard also and you will potentially trash the ecosystem and then when you have really bizarre outbreaks of problems and come and ask me what it, I'll just shake my head and go like, I never see that. What did you do? Right. It's from putting down wide spectrum granular baits. You don't need to kill everything in your yard. If you have specific ant hill that you need to get rid of, get a uh, bait and just apply it according to the directions just around the mount and take care of just that pile of ants. There are plenty of good, beneficial, minding their own business ants out in your yard. I just ignore them. I just, you know, my wife, she'll, oh my gosh, there's a little, there's an ant hole in the sidewalk where they're coming to go. I'm like, yeah, so who cares? I'm not going to do anything about it for ants. And um, our native ants are, keeping them are the best way to take up the niche that perhaps the fire ants would come in and take. So, yes, and and there's, also, uh, there's other ones that are beneficial. They consume a lot of insect pests on your landscape plants. Other ones like harvester ants eat weed seeds. Hey, that's a, you know, if you're trying to have fewer weeds, why not have ants that will eat the weed seeds for you? Saves you some time and money. So not all ants are bad. Some are. And the bad ones you need to get rid of. Just get a bait and bait right around that one mount, that one hill. We also discuss that if you go to Hernando County Government YouTube and look up things that bite, sting, or taste you. I think it's either in part one or part two. I think it's part two. We talk about fire ants. Yeah. So and we we kind of discuss it in general. Here's our some of our upcoming classes. We're going to have a whole series in April about um, basically how it's called rotted. Uh, recycled and resurrected. I have the chat covering that up. <laughs> there we go. Um, and we're going to start on Tuesday. So we won't have a Wednesday class next week. We'll have three Tuesdays in a row. Skip a week because Lily's going back to the office <laughs> the first week in May. Need to get reset up there. Then um, I will finish that series on a Wednesday. But it's all kind of about how you know, we have been, we want everything so sanitized in our yard. We don't want to see anything that resembles anything dead or anything. And really all through nature, death always brings new life. 
So we're kind of going to cover that starting with soil science next week with Master Gardener Bernie. And I think it'll be very, very interesting. Um, do you see that? Is there a type of Bahia seed that is best for Candler sand? Yes, I see that. And both germinate and grow equally well. The main difference between them is, let's see if I get this correct. Argentine is for your lawn. Yes, our homeowners prefer Argentine because it gets fewer of those seed heads. Pensacola gets lots of seed heads, so DOT prefers it to plant alongside of the highway. DOT doesn't care about the seed heads. Homeowners have a problem with them. I don't have a, I, I don't know if I have a lot of seed heads or few seed heads. I don't really care about it. Right. The seed heads, a lot of the seed that it makes is viable seed. So a lot of people will let their behaviour grow for an extra couple of days in the summer to make lots of seed heads. So when you mow it, you're blowing those seeds all over the place. That is free behaviour seed to thicken your lawn up a tiny bit. So every little bit helps. But um, both the um, Argentine and the Pensacola are going to do equally well in Candler sand. You know how I remember which is which? Because Argentine, Argentine starts with an A and you want an A plus lawn. There you <laughs> so, go. That's just always stuck with me. So, all right. I think, oh, uh, I don't know if Karen is available, but that is our class for today. And I will just let her leave with a little advertisement for mosquito control as well. Okay. Thank you. That was an awesome class. I was here through it throughout. Um, just a quick reminder, we're heading into springtime. It's a time when we're going to get a lot of rain. We're going to be doing gardening. We're going to be accumulating rain or water in those uh, empty pails and buckets or whatever may be out in your yard. Be sure to dump and drain them. That'll make your environment a whole lot more comfortable for you. However, if you are experiencing a problem with mosquitoes, uh, just give us a call. Our number here, I'm going to put it in the chat, is 352-540-6552. And one of our friendly technicians will come out, they'll you know, take a look around the yard, see where those mosquitoes are breeding, where they're coming from, and we'll take care of that for you. Uh, we are a county office, so this is uh, part of our services to our residents. And that is for her name of county. Very thank much, you. Karen, and thank you, Dr. Lester. Um, there will be a virtual plant clinic. Um, you have to go to that Hernando Extension, Hernando EXT Facebook page, hop on to that um, tomorrow at 10. It'll actually be me and hopefully Master Gardener Bernie. I don't know if you've asked him yet. Dr. It's Lester. pretty well lined up. He has the link and Teresa's going to help set him up with the camera. So Okay, um, because Dr. Lester has another meeting he has to be at, but we'll be glad to help you. All that, um, with that, you send in your questions in the chat and we do our best to answer them spontaneously as best we can, or we'll get back with you if we don't know the answers. So thank you everybody and have a great weekend. We will see you for another class next Tuesday. Thank you. Great, Bye -bye. thank you, see you then.